Thanks for joining the Christian Perspective channel. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and turn on the notifications bell so you don't miss a thing. Okay, this is part four of our series on Ephraim. Um, we're covering some of the history of Ephraim when Ephraim was the dominant tribe in the north of Israel. Uh, this is necessary for us to understand, to understand who Ephraim was and who Ephraim is. So bear with me because it's a, a bit of a difficult concept, but it's going to be pretty clear by the time we're done this series. So eventually Samuel had two sons and they became judges in Beersheba, but they were evil and took bribes and perverted judgment. So the elders of Israel came to Samuel and said, Your sons do not walk in your ways. Make us a king to judge us like the nations have. This idea displeased Samuel, and he prayed to God. Yahweh said, They have not rejected you. They have rejected me to reign over them. Tell them they will have a king, but this is the kind of king they will have. He will take your sons for his horsemen and his chariots. He will appoint captains of thousands and captains of fifties to sow his ground and reap his harvest and make his instruments of war. And he will take your daughters to be preparers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and your vineyards and your olive yards and give them to his servants and he will take a tenth of your seed and give them to his officers and servants. He will take your best maids and young men and your donkeys and make them work for him. And he will take a tenth of your sheep and you will be his servants. And you will cry out in that day because of your king and Yahweh will not hear you. But the people refused to hear Samuel and said, No, we will have a king over us. And we will be like all the nations, and he will judge us, and he will go out before us and fight our battles. And Samuel told Yahweh all that they said, and Yahweh said, Okay, make a king for them. So now we're in chapter 9 of First Samuel. There was a man named Saul of the tribe of Benjamin who was very tall, from the shoulders up above the crowd. There was not among the children of Israel a goodlier person. His father sent him to look for his asses who had wandered off. He went all over looking for them, and it got to the point when he said to his fellows, We'd better head home, or soon my father will be more worried about me than the asses. His friend said to him, We are near the town where the prophet Samuel lives. Why don't we first go there and give him a coin, to ask him if he could tell us where to look for the asses. Saul went and found Samuel. God had already let Samuel know that a Benjamite was coming and that he was to be anointed king to save Israel from the Philistines. When Samuel saw Saul, God told him, This is the man I was talking about. Samuel told Saul to spend the night and have dinner with him, and in the morning he will tell him all that he wants to know. And don't worry about the asses, because they have been found. Samuel then treated him like a king at dinner in front of everyone. The next day, as Samuel was seeing Saul off, he took a bottle of oil and anointed him captain over the inheritance of God. So, anointing him, uh, the prophet would take a bottle of olive oil and pour it over his head. And that was... Um, anointing him to be king. He then gave Saul very specific instructions. He said, When you leave, you will find two men by Rachel's grave, and they will say to you, The asses you went to seek are now found, and now your father worries over you. Then you will come to the plain of Tabor, and you will meet three men on their way to Bethel, one carrying three kids, or three baby goats, another carrying three loaves of bread, and another carrying a bottle of wine. They will salute you and give you two loaves of bread, which you will receive. Then you will come to the hill of God, 
where there is a garrison of the Philistines, and you will meet a company of prophets coming down from the high place with instruments. Sing, and the Spirit of Yahweh will come upon you, and you will sing with them, and be changed into another man. When you see all of these signs, then do what you like, because God is with you. Then go to Gilgal, and wait for me for seven days, and then I will come and offer sacrifices and show you what you shall do. You see Gilgal there on the right side of Ephraim, by the river Jordan there. And that was a great camp where the children of Israel renewed their covenant with God just before they attacked the fortress of Jericho. This was the first great victory west of the Jordan River by Israel. And the three signs happened to Saul that day, exactly as Samuel had described. And when he had finished prophesying, he went to the high place where he met his uncle. And his uncle asked him, where did you go? He said, I went to seek the asses, and when I didn't find them, I went to the prophet Samuel. And his uncle asked him, what did Samuel say to you? He told him that Samuel told me the asses had been found, but he didn't tell him anything else that happened. Samuel called the people of Yahweh together at Mizpah, and he said to them, Thus says Yahweh, God of Israel, I brought Israel out of Egypt and delivered you from all your oppressors, and this day you have rejected your God who saved you from all of your tribulations. You have said to him, No, but set a king over us. Now set yourselves before Yahweh by your tribes. From the tribes he chose Benjamin, and from Benjamin he chose the family of Matri, and from them he chose Saul, the son of Kish, but he could not be found. They inquired of Yahweh where he could be found, and it was revealed that he was hiding among the goods. They fetched him and stood him before the people. He was supposed to be at Gilgal waiting. And he was taller than any of the people from his shoulders upward. And Samuel said to the people, This is the man who Yahweh has chosen, that there is nobody like him from among the people. And the people shouted, God saved the king. Samuel told the people the manner of the kingdom, and he wrote it in a book and laid it up before Yahweh, the manner we have already read from chapter 8. He will take your sons for his horsemen and his chariots. He will appoint captains of thousands and captains of fifties to sow his ground and reap his harvest and make his instruments of war. And he will take your daughters to be preparers, cooks, and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and your vineyards and your olive yards and give them to his servants. He will take a tenth of your seed and give them to his officers and servants. He will take your best maids and young men and your donkeys and make them work for him. He will take a tenth of your sheep and you will be his servants. And you will cry out in that day because of your king and Yahweh will not hear you. After that, Saul went home to Gibeah and a band of men whose hearts God had touched went with him. But the children of Belial said, How shall this man save us? And they despised him. But Saul held his peace. Now we're in chapter 11 of First Samuel. Nahash, an Ammonite, came with his army and besieged a town called Jabesh-Gilead. And the men of Jabesh said to him, Make an agreement with us and we will serve you. He answered, I will make an agreement with you that I will remove all of your right eyes for a reproach upon all of Israel. The elders of Jabesh answered them, Give us seven days to see if we can find a man to save us, and if not, we will come out to you. When Saul heard about it, the Spirit of God came upon him, and he became angry. He slaughtered a yoke of oxen and cut them to pieces and sent them through all of Israel with messengers, saying, Whoever does not come out with Saul and Samuel, this is what will be done to his oxen. And the fear of Yahweh fell upon the people, and they all came out united, 330,000 strong. 
He sent messengers to Jabesh, by noon tomorrow you will have help, and they were glad. They told Nahash the Ammonite, at noon tomorrow we will come out to you. <laughs> In the morning Saul divided the army into three companies, and they rushed upon the enemy, slaying them until the heat of the day, and they were all dispersed and scattered. And the people said to Samuel, who are those who said, Shall Saul reign over us? Bring them out, that we may put them to death. But Saul said, They shall be no man put to death today, because this day Yahweh has wrought salvation in Israel. Then Samuel said, Let us gather at Gilgal and renew the kingdom there. So they went to Gilgal and sacrificed to Yahweh, and they made Saul king and rejoiced greatly. Chapter 12 and Samuel said to the people, I have listened to you and set up a king over you. I am old and gray, and I have walked before you since my childhood, and now I stand before you. Is anyone a witness against me before Yahweh or his anointed? Have I defrauded anyone or taken a bribe to look the other way? They answered, No, you haven't. Then he said, it is Yahweh that advanced Moses and Aaron who brought your fathers out of Egypt and made them dwell in this place. And when they forgot their God, Yahweh, he sold them into the hands of the Ammonites and the Philistines and Moab, and they fought against them. And they cried to Yahweh and said, We have sinned and served Baalim and Ashtaroth, but now deliver us from our enemies and we will serve you. And Yahweh sent Jerubbabel, Gideon, Bedan, Jephthah, and Samuel, and delivered you out of the hand of your enemies, and you dwelled safe. And when you saw Nahash, the king of Ammon, came against you, then you said to me, No, but a king shall reign over us, when Yahweh your God was your king. Now behold, the king you have chosen, and who you have desired, and behold, Yahweh has set a king over you. If you will fear Yahweh and serve him and obey his voice and his commands, then both you and your king shall continue following Yahweh your God. But if you will not obey and rebel, then the hand of Yahweh shall be against you, as it was against your fathers. Now see this sign which Yahweh shall do before your eyes. He shall send thunder and rain that you may perceive that your wickedness is great. And Samuel prayed, and a great thunder and rain came. And the people said to Samuel, Pray for us, that we do not die, because we have added to all our sins this evil, asking for a king. Samuel said, Fear not, only continue to serve Yahweh, for he will not forsake his people for his great name's sake. And because it has pleased Yahweh to make you his people. And God forbid that I should sin against Yahweh in ceasing to pray for you. Only fear Yahweh and serve him in truth with all your heart. For consider what great things he has done for you. But if you shall do wickedly, you shall be consumed, both you and your king. So this is like a, it's a reiteration of the covenant again. Uh, the cursing or the blessing. If they follow Yahweh, then they will still be blessed. But if they don't, them and their king will be cursed. Yahweh will be against them. So chapter 13. After reigning for two years, Saul chose 3,000 men from Israel. 200 were with Saul around Bethel, and 1,000 were with his son Jonathan at Gibeah. During this time, the Philistines had garrisons set up within Benjamin and Ephraim and Judah, and the Israelites were not allowed to own swords or spears, and they were not allowed to have smiths or to make anything. The Israelites had to go to the Philistines to get their knives or axes or plows sharpened, but they had a file for small sharpening jobs. When Jonathan had his 1,000 men, he destroyed the garrison of the Philistines at Gibeah, near Gibeah. And Saul blew the trumpet all through Israel and gathered the people at Gilgal. 
declaring war on the Philistines. And the Philistines gathered for war at Michmash. Michmash is a military strategic location just east of Bethel. They had 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen. And the Israelites became afraid and hid themselves in the caves and the bushes and the rocks. And some of them ran across the Jordan to Gad and Gilead. Saul was in Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. And Saul waited seven days, according to the time Samuel had appointed, two years ago. But when Samuel did not come, and the people scattered, Saul then offered up the burnt offering to Yahweh, which only a priest was allowed to do. As soon as he finished the offering, Samuel showed up. And Saul went out to meet him and salute him, but Samuel said, What have you done? Saul said, Well, the people scattered, and you didn't come within the seven days, and the Philistines were gathered. I figured the Philistines were coming now upon me at Gilgal, and I have not made an offering to Yahweh. So I forced myself and offered an offering. Samuel said, You have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of Yahweh your God. Now Yahweh would have established your kingdom forever, but now it shall not continue. For Yahweh has sought a man after his own heart and commanded him to be captain over his people. But you have not kept that which Yahweh has commanded you. Then Samuel left and went to Gibeah, and Saul counted the people with him about 600 men. Saul and Jonathan went to Gibeah with their army of 600, and the Philistines were still camped in Michmash. The Philistines sent out three companies to scout the area in three directions. Only Saul and Jonathan had swords. Chapter 14 Jonathan took his armor-bearer and went off to scout out the Philistines, but he didn't tell his father Saul. And they saw a garrison of the Philistines. So Jonathan said to his armor-bearer, There is nothing stopping Yahweh from saving by many or by few. And we will show ourselves to these uncircumcised Philistines. And if they say, Wait here until we come to you, then we are caught. But if they say, Come here to us, then that will be a sign that Yahweh has given us victory, and we will go over and attack them. And they showed themselves to the Philistines and said, Look, the Hebrews have come out of the holes where they have hid. And they called Jonathan, Come here. Jonathan says, That is the sign that Yahweh has given us victory. Let's go kill them. And they went over and killed them, about twenty men. And there was an earthquake, and the earth shook, and everyone felt it. And there was a general panic. The Philistines began fighting each other, and the Israelites, who had surrendered to the Philistines, turned on them. And all the Israelites, which hid in the holes and in the bushes, came out and turned on the Philistines. And there was a great slaughter, and the battleground was now at the Philistine camp near Bethel. Saul had checked to see who was missing from his troops, and he found that only Jonathan and his armor-bearer were missing. Saul then told his troops the next day, Cursed is anyone who eats food before evening, for I will be avenged of my enemies. And they attacked the Philistine camp all day. And when they entered the woodland, there was honey dripping from the tree. And Jonathan was not aware of the curse his father had made, and he took a taste of the honey, and he was strengthened. Then Jonathan was told about the curse his father had made, and he said, My father has troubled the land, because how many more could the warriors kill if only they could eat something and be stronger? And they fought all that day until evening, and at evening when the curse was over, they were hungry, so they slaughtered the sheep and oxen, but did not drain the blood which was forbidden. And Saul was told they were sinning by eating blood, And Saul set up a great stone and had the animals brought before him to make sure the blood was drained before the men could eat. It took most of the night. 
And Saul said, Let us go down and attack the remaining Philistines before light and finish them off. Then the priest said, Let us inquire of Yahweh to see if we should do this. And they inquired, but Yahweh did not answer. Saul called all the elders together and said, Let us find out who sinned today, because even if it be Jonathan my son, he shall surely die. And they drew lots until they found out it was Jonathan, because he ate the honey. And Saul said, You shall surely die, Jonathan. But the people stood up and said, Jonathan has brought salvation to Israel today. Not one hair of his head shall fall to the ground. So Saul gave up pursuing the Philistines, and the Philistines escaped back to their home. Saul went on after that, fighting against Moab, Edom, Ammon, the Amalekites, and he was at war with the Philistines for the rest of his days. Whenever he saw a strong young man of Israel, he took him for the army. Chapter 15 Amalek was the king of the Amalekites who attacked the children of Israel at the waters of Horab when they were encamped at the mountain of God during their exodus from Egypt. Horab is where Moses split the rock in two and water poured out for the children of Israel. Some of you will remember the story of when Israel was attacked and Moses held up his staff and as long as he held up his staff, Israel led by Joshua was winning. But when his arm got tired and dropped, Israel was losing. And Aaron and Hur stood on each side of Moses and held his arms up until the going down of the sun. You can read about all of this in Exodus chapter 17. This unprovoked attack on Israel by the Amalekites got Amalek a promise of annihilation from God. Exodus 16:14. And the Lord said to Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. So Samuel comes to visit Saul, and he says, Yahweh sent me to anoint you king over Israel. Now listen to the voice of Yahweh. Thus says Yahweh, I remember what Amalek did to Israel how he laid wait for him in the way when he came out of Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek, utterly destroy all they have, man and woman, infant, toddler, ox, sheep, camel, and donkey. Saul gathered the army in Talim. Now Talim, you'll see down in Judah, down near Beersheba, to the right of Beersheba there is Talim. So he gathered the army there of 200,000 footmen and 10,000 men of Judah, and they massacred the Amalekites. The, the Amalekites were on the coast just below the Philistines and just um, left of the wilderness of Zin in that area. So Saul gathered the army in Talim, 200,000 footmen and 10,000 men of Judah, and they massacred the Amalekites. But they kept the best of the sheep and oxen, and destroyed the rest. And they kept King Agag of the Amalekites alive, but captured him. Then the word of Jehovah came to Samuel, I regret setting up Saul to be king, for he has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried all night to Yahweh. Samuel rose early and met Saul at Gilgal. And Saul said, Blessed be thou of Yahweh, I have performed the command of Yahweh. Samuel then said, What is the bleeding of sheep in my ears, and the lowing of oxen? Saul said, Well, the people brought them from the Amalekites, and they spared the best of the sheep and oxen to sacrifice to Yahweh at Gilgal, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. Samuel said, When you were little in your own sight, you were made the king of Israel. And Yahweh sent you on a journey and said, Go, and completely destroy the sinners, the Amalekites. But you did not obey the voice of Yahweh, and you took the spoil and did evil in the sight of Yahweh. Saul said, Yes, I have obeyed Yahweh and gone the way which Yahweh sent me, and I have brought Agag, the king of the Amalekites." 
and have utterly destroyed the Amekalites. But the people took the spoil of the sheep and oxen to sacrifice to Yahweh in Gilgal. Samuel answered, Has Yahweh as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of Yahweh? To obey is better than sacrifice, because rebellion is like the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is like iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of Yahweh, he has rejected you from being king. Saul said, I have sinned because I have transgressed the commandment of Yahweh and your words because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now therefore pardon my sin and turn again with me that I may worship Yahweh. Samuel replied, I will not return with you because you have rejected the word of Yahweh and Yahweh has rejected you from being king over Israel. As Samuel turned to leave, Saul grabbed the edge of his clothing and it ripped. And Samuel said to him, Yahweh has ripped the kingdom of Israel from you this day and has given it to your neighbor who is better than you. Saul said, I have sinned, but honor me now before the elders of my people and before Israel and turn again with me that I may worship Yahweh your God. So Samuel turned again with Saul and Saul worshipped Yahweh. Then Samuel said, Bring me Agag, king of the Amalekites." Agag came delicately and said, Surely the bitterness of death is past. Samuel said, As your sword has made women childless, so shall your mother be childless among women. And Samuel hacked him to pieces before Yahweh in Gilgal. Then they all went home. After a while, Yahweh said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, because I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse, a man of Bethlehem, because I have provided myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. Chapter 16 Yahweh said, Take a cow with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to Yahweh, and call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will tell you what to do after that. Samuel went to Bethlehem, and the elders came out trembling and asked him, Do you come in peace? <laughs> I guess word got around what he did to that king. He said yes, and he told them, I came to sacrifice so prepare yourselves, and call Jesse and his sons to come to the sacrifice. He saw Jesse's oldest son, who was tall and handsome, and he said, Surely this is the man. But Yahweh said, No, that is not him, because Yahweh looks not upon the outward appearance, but upon the heart. Jesse presented all seven of his sons to Samuel, but not one of them were accepted. He then asked, Do you have any other children? Jesse said, There is only the youngest, but he is out watching the sheep. Samuel said, Send and fetch him. We will not sit down till he comes. When he walked in, he was ruddy and handsome. And Yahweh said, Anoint him, he is the one. Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of Yahweh came upon David from that day forward. But the spirit of Yahweh departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from Yahweh troubled him. Saul's servants said to him, An evil spirit troubles you. Let us find someone who can play the harp well, and when the evil spirit from God troubles you, he will play the harp and you will be well. Saul sent them to find such a man. Then one of the servants told him about a boy named David from Bethlehem, who was very good with the harp, as well as many other things. So Saul sent for him, because David wrote the songs, which are all songs. And those are songs that he played on the harp. Um, you've seen the ancient harp. It's a little bit different than our modern harp. So David stood before Saul, and he became his armor-bearer. 
Whenever the evil spirit from El came upon Saul, David played the harp, and the evil spirit departed from him. You'll see if you get into any spiritual warfare, if you have any trouble with uh, evil spirits that are in your life troubling you, Psalms, read Psalms, or even read them out loud, because they're actually designed to um, chase out evil spirits, because David sang those to Saul to get rid of the evil spirits. But I think any, any part of the Bible is good. But uh, the Psalms are very beautiful. There's something very special about the Psalms. Okay, chapter 17. Now we are not so interested in David and Saul as we were in Samuel, because this episode is about Ephraim and Manasseh. I will very quickly summarize Saul and David's kingdom, because it's important to understand the political atmosphere at the time and to understand Ephraim more clearly. The life of Samuel, who was the last judge of Israel before they became a kingdom, gives us a great picture of life in ancient Israel during the time of the judges. The tent of Yahweh, where the Ark of the Covenant was kept, resided in Shiloh until it was captured by the Philistines upon the death of Eli and his sons. Since then, the ark resided in the house of Eleazar at kerath Jerim, which is somewhere within about 30 miles of Jerusalem. The town of Jerusalem had not yet been captured by the Israelites at that time. It remained a Jebusite stronghold within the territory of Benjamin. The, De the Jebusite were one of the Canaanite tribes. While the ark was there, in the house of Eleazar, the tent of meeting at Shiloh still was, off, was actively offering daily sacrifices to Yahweh. The Philistines, Amorites, and Canaanites were generally living among the Israelites, or vice versa, and power sometimes shifted back and forth between them. When the Israelites forgot Yahweh, they became weak. And when they repented, they became strong. Saul did a lot to establish the rule of Israel over the land in general. He formed a permanent standing army, and he subjugated the nations around Israel to the east and south, and he was at constant war with the Philistines. David did not step straight into the office of king. Saul continued on the throne in Gibeah for several years. David started out as Saul's armor bearer and harp player. Then he defeats the giant Goliath, which is a very popular story that most people know, David and Goliath, when David was still a young boy. He defeated him with a sling and a stone and his faith in Yahweh. He then led Israel into a great victory over the Philistines at the defeat of Goliath. This led to David becoming best friends with Jonathan, the son of Saul, because Jonathan was a great warrior already. After that, the people began to respect David more than Saul, and Saul became jealous of David. He wanted to get him out of the palace, so he made David a captain over a thousand in the army. When David was among the people more, the people began to love David more and more. Saul became afraid of David and wanted to rein him in, so he gave David his daughter to be a wife. David took this as a great honor that he would be a son-in-law to the king. Eventually, after trying several ways to get David killed, Saul's hatred for David became clear and David went into hiding. This is when he ended up at Nob, the city of Levites, and they gave him the bread from the holy bread for his men. We covered this in episode 15, part 1, when Doeg the Edomite slew the city and the 85 priests at Nob. One thing I did notice, if you take a look at the names of the priests in Nob, you will see they are descendants of Ichabod, the grandson of Eli, the high priest who raised Samuel, 
whose family was cursed by God to all die in their prime. David had many exploits when in hiding from Saul, which is all recorded in the Bible. He had a chance to take Saul's life several times, but he did not. Each time he got Saul to confess he was wrong and let him live each time. Saul was afraid of a coming battle with the Philistines, and he was not being answered by Yahweh, so he decided to visit the witch of Endor. Endor is a city in Israel. Uh, I guess she was a Canaanite. Uh, witchcraft was um, outlawed by Saul. And she was very afraid because she knew it was him, even though he was disguised. But he went to visit her, and he asked her to conjure up the spirit of Samuel for him because Samuel had recently died. Samuel came to him and prophesied his death. Saul and his sons then died in the battle against the Philistines, leaving David to take the throne of Israel. David first used Hebron as the base of his kingdom. Now Hebron you see down in Judah there, uh, below Bethlehem. Hebron was the city where... Um, Abraham lived, and Sarah lived, Abraham's wife. Um, I'm pretty sure they're buried there. Abraham, Isaac, Sarah, and Rebecca are all uh, buried in Hebron. So that was a, a, a major city for the Israelites. So David set up his uh, kingdom in Hebron. And he was proclaimed king of Judah. The Philistines had cut off the head of Saul and put his armor in the temple of Ashtaroth and hanged his body on a wall along with the bodies of his sons. The people in a city in Gilead named Jabesh heard about the bodies of Saul and his sons and they sent warriors by night to go and retrieve the bodies and they burned them at Jabesh and buried the ashes under a tree, and then they fasted for seven days. When David heard what they had done for Saul and his sons, he sent messengers to Jabesh to thank them and bless them for what they had done for Saul. Abner, who was Saul's captain of his army, he proclaimed Ishbotheth the son of Saul, as king over Gilead and all of Israel. Israel and Judah were at war for over seven years between Ishbosheth and David. One day Ishbosheth spoke badly about his captain Abner because he was having relations with Saul's ex concubine. He said to Abner, Why have you gone into my father's concubine? Abner then turned against Ishbosheth and brought all of Israel to follow David as king. Abner came to Hebron to meet with David, and he was sent away in peace. Joab, who was David's captain of, the, of his army, heard that Abner had been there, and he called for a meeting with Abner without David knowing about it. And Joab killed Abner because Abner had killed Joab's brother during the wars. David then condemned Joab's actions and had a great funeral for Abner so that all Israel knew that it was not David who killed Abner. David then moved on Jerusalem, which was a city of the Jebusites, one of the Canaanite tribes, taking it from them and making Jerusalem his capital city. He named it the city of David. David then drove the Philistines out of Israel. After that, he brought the Ark of the Covenant, which had been near Gibeah all this time, and he brought it to Jerusalem. Now we're at about 2 Samuel chapter 7 now. When David had rest from his enemies and he was established, he called the prophet Nathan and said to him, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the Ark of God dwells in curtains. Nathan said to the king, Do all that is within your heart. For Yahweh is with you. Then God said to Nathan the prophet, Go and tell my servant David, 
This is 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 5 to 16. Um, through this whole story, I've been kind of truncating the Bible, t- telling the story in a short form, because to make the video a lot shorter. Uh, this here is an exact quote, because it's an important part to, to understand. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 5 to 16. Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, Shall thou build me a house for me to dwell in? Whereas I have not dwelt in any house since the time that I brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt, even to this day, but have walked in a tent and in a tabernacle. In all the places wherein I have walked with all the children of Israel, spoke I a word with any of the tribes of Israel, who I commanded to feed my people Israel, saying, Why build you not me a house of cedar? Now therefore, so shall thou say unto my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took thee from following the sheep to be a ruler over my people, over Israel. And I was with thee whithersoever thou went, and have cut off all thy enemies out of thy sight, and have made thee a great name, like the name of a great men that are in the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them, and they may dwell in a place of their own, and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. And as since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people, Israel, and have caused thee to rest from all thy enemies, also the Lord tells thee that he will make thee a house. And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up your seed after you, which shall proceed out of your bowels, and I will establish his kingdom." He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him, as I took it from Saul, who I put away before thee. And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. Um, This is a very famous prophecy because uh, David's son actually wasn't, uh, didn't sit on the throne forever. His son Solomon. Um, This is a, a prophecy of the Messiah. And Jesus was a son of David. They call, that's one of the names they called him. And he was of the lineage of David. And Jesus was placed on the throne forever. So David was then very humbled. And he thanked God. And said, let it be as you have spoken. Thanks for joining the Christian Perspective channel. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe and turn on the notifications bell so you don't miss a thing.